trustee of butterfly conservation. Um, Chris is going to share some of his fantastic knowledge on these two species and sort of set the scene for us. Um, then Mick and I are going to give a brief description of what we've been up to as part of the Boone project and um, with these two butterflies. Um, following that we'll have David Wainwright, Senior Conservation Manager of Northern England. Um, we'll be talking about his work with the Duke of Burgundy over in the North East. Um, and finally, um, a talk about farmer and landowner engagement with Martin Wayne, who is Regional Conservation Officer at Butterfly Conservation. Um, so thanks again for coming and I'll just pass over to Mick for a little introduction. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Ellie, and welcome everybody. Yeah, Mick Mayhew, I also work for the Boone Project and I share the work uh, with Ellie on the Duke of Burgundy side and I'm also involved um, in a Pine Martin feasibility study. So I will just share my screen with you. Um, can, can you all see that? Ellie, can you see that clear? So what I'd like to do is just start by giving you a very brief three to four minute introduction kind of overview of the Boone project itself. Um, I know Chris is bursting with enthusiasm and uh, knowledge and he's got about 387 slides he wants to impart to you so I'm going to be very brief with that introduction but actually before I go there I just wanted to show you this image because for a budding butterfly ecologist like myself who is still learning this is an image that was sent to me by Jim Asher who is also involved in butterfly conservation and it's utterly fascinating and brilliant and at first glance it looks fairly ordinary so you might think it's just the developing seed head <coughs> of a kidney vetch flower but actually if you harness your powers of observation and look more carefully, most of you will notice that at the top end of this seed head, there is an arachnid, um, a spider waiting in the wings to pounce upon any unsuspecting prey. And then just a few of you may have noticed that down here, if you follow my cursor, there is um, the larva of a small blue butterfly. So what started as a very ordinary looking picture is actually much more complex and tells a really interesting sort of ecological tale. So there are the building blocks of an ecosystem going on here. And it also sort of talks to me of, um, of a sort of uh, an evolutionary arms race between predator and prey. So whilst the larva is evolving adaptations to avoid detection by the predator, so in turn, the spider presumably is evolving um, uh, enhanced sensory organs and sensory systems to be able to detect those increasingly camouflaged larvae. So it's a really fascinating uh, image and I have gone off at a slight tangent here but I thought it might fire you up for this webinar just as it did me. So let me move on and just tell you a little bit about the Boom Project. Okay, good, minor technical glitch. Um, so let me tell you about the Boom Project. It's essentially a four year lottery funded, community based, multi species reintroduction project. And that's quite a mouthful. In essence, um, it's, a, it's something that was set up um, or it's, it started in September 2019. It's a four year project, runs to 2023. It's administered through the University of Cumbria um, and the sort of core partners on the project that were involved in the development stage uh, are Cumbria Wildlife Trust, Natural England, Forestry England and Morecambe Bay Partnership. Um, that said, there are a whole host of other partners involved at a species level. So butterfly cons conservation, working with the, the Duke of Burgundy in the small blue, PTES, People's uh, Trust for Endangered Species on the Dormouse, Kew Gardens, and many others. Um, so in essence, it was the brainchild of Bart Donato, who works for Natural England, and Ian Convery at the University of Cumbria. And they saw that in this very spectacular region of South Cumbria, um, there had been an awful lot of habitat restoration that had taken place. Um, so many habitats had been returned into good condition by Cumbria Wildlife Trust, all sorts of 
organizations, Morecambe Bay partnership with their Headlands to Headspace project. But actually fundamentally, we now needed to move to the next stage, which was replacing those species that are missing. So to really return the resilience and the function to those ecosystems, we now need to reintroduce a suite of um, endangered, uh, either locally extinct or endangered uh, species. <clears throat> so there are a number of objectives in the project, but they can they can probably all be summarized in one sort of statement. Essentially, what Boom is trying to do is to work with, um, learn from, train a group of individuals from the communities in the project area so that those individuals can support the boom reintroduction uh, activities. And in turn, um, boom can then support those volunteers with uh, health and well-being benefits, skills development, and so on. So it's really about forging relationships with the community and building capacity for landscape restoration and species reintroduction. Uh, in that area. And there are, you know, it's very inclusive. There are a whole number of groups we're working with from students at the university to school children to prisoners from HMP Haverig. But fundamentally, the priority is to work with, the, work in those areas of multi, multiple deprivation out west, like Barrow in Furness, um, and develop relationships with those communities who really have most to gain from what we're trying to do. In other words, these are the communities that uh, live adjacent to some of the richest sort of mosaic of protected habitats in the land and just never access it. And it's a question of understanding those barriers, the physical barriers, financial barriers, social barriers, and finding ways to overcome them. So Boom's approach, I guess, fundamentally is about providing people with access and exposure to those natural landscapes so they can learn, increase their knowledge base, and then they're more likely to join training events and gain skills. Ultimately, of course, what it boils down to is that we want people to act for nature. Um, so actions speak louder than words. We want the end result to be that group of people who are prepared to um, take out a membership with Cumbria Wildlife Trust, enroll as students on a conservation program at the University of Cumbria, volunteer for BOOM, whatever it happens to be. So this is the Motley crew, which is the BOOM team. And uh, our chief lady is Jo in the center. She's fantastic. She comes to, she brings a wealth of experience working in, with community forestry projects. Um, so Joe is our project manager. Uh, the rest of us, apart from Michelle um, on the left of your screens, there are four project officers, Deb, Stephen, myself, and Ellie. And uh, we bring, a, we bring a, a variety of transferable skills and expertise to boom on the basis that most of us are actually involved with other uh, landscape restoration and reintroduction projects in this country and abroad. Michelle is an absolute legend. Michelle does um, the promotion and the media side for us and the events organization and volunteer. Uh, she coordinates all the volunteers. So she works part-time for Morecambe Bay Partnership and part-time for Boom. And does a really fantastic job. Okay, so where are we working? Well, it's a very large project area. It extends from the shipyards in Barrow and Furness to the west, all the way to the AONB in the east and Grisdale Forest in the north. Um, we're, not, we're working predominantly in protected areas, designated areas, but not exclusively. So for example, up here in the north, um, where's my cursor? Grisdale and Roslands were involved with Pine Martin work and Duke of Burgundy work. Whit Barrow, as most of you will be aware, is mostly about priority butterflies, Arnside and Silverdale. Ellie's doing a lot of work um, with protected plant species like Speedwell, uh, green-winged orchid and so on. And right out here, Ellie is also working on the slag banks with the small blue butterfly. 
And just to finish off, um, this is the short list, if you like. So there are well in excess. When Bart Donato was writing the report before we developed this project, there was, I think, I seem to remember, there were well in excess of 100 species that were either threatened or extinct in South Cumbria. And they were shortlisted, in essence, to this list of 12, 10 of which we will reintroduce and two of which we're doing feasibility work around. And they seem like a disparate bunch of species, but actually there was a lot of thought that went into uh, the decisions that were finally taken by the steering group. So um, there were various criterion in the selection of species. Uh, for example, did the species have potential for com community engagement, uh, value for money decisions, likelihood of success decisions? Were they suitable given climate change forecasts and so on? Uh, uh, and I'll just end by saying that Although there are this, um, although we're dealing with a whole number of species, the focus of our talk tonight is the Duke of Burgundy butterfly and the small blue butterfly. And uh, we'd like to give you a sort of regional perspective on not just the work of Boom, but the work of our fantastic partners as well. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mick. Um, just a reminder that if anyone has any questions, including anything Boom related at all, then please feel free to throw it in the chat box. Um, next up, we have Chris Winnick. Chris, are you ready? I'm just about. Great, thank you. So, uh, okay, folks, can you all hear me? Yeah, we can. So, yes, from, from some anyway, unless you're muted. Um, just a few nice, pretty pictures to start with. But we're going to end with uh, the butterfly we're going to look at first. In the centre, you'll see the Duke of Burgundy. Until not that long ago, it was called the Duke of Burgundy Fritillary, uh, because it does look a little bit like some of the other fritillaries shown on that montage there, but it's not a fritillary. Um, it's actually a member of the Metal Marks family. It's uh, a large family, but there's only one representative in the UK, i.e. the Duke of Burgundy. Uh, it's mainly a tropical family. Most of them are in South America, for example, in Central America. And are very exotic, but we're delighted to have at least one member of that, uh, that family here in the UK. Um, it's a rare butterfly, and uh, we'll look at it in a little more detail, but uh, first of all, just to set the uh, context, um, don't worry too much if you can't read the bottom of that uh, graph, but the Duke of Burgundy, I think, is about sixth in from the left-hand side, and all the red bars on the left-hand side show a decline. So all these species, if I can show the cursor, can you see the cursor? All these species at this end are in heavy decline. Uh, as we move this way, some species are doing much better, but certainly the Duke of Burgundy has declined considerably over the years. And later on, we'll be looking at the uh, small blue, which is also uh, in decline. Um, we can, as you know, divide butterflies very crudely and broadly into two groups, the habitat specialists and the wider countryside species. Um, again, don't worry about the detail in this slide, but uh, the small blue and the Duke of Burgundy are very much habitat specialists. The uh, fastest declining butterflies in the UK are these, and you'll see the Duke of Burgundy is third down uh, with an 84% decline since 1976. I'm not going to go through all the others, but uh, it just sets into context the uh, situation. Now, there is some good news. Um, if we look from 76, certainly the decline looks very, very serious. But um, over the last 10, 15 years or so, uh, the population, albeit under threat and still at a low level, uh, is beginning to stabilize. Um, so that is very promising. Now, habitat specialists such as the Duke of Burgundy um, are particularly likely to, uh, to be under threat if habitats are under threat. So they are, are often very particular. They need particular habitats. They're often very colonial. Um, they don't like fragmentation. They are fairly sedentary. They don't like to wander. So if a habitat declines, they don't easily find another habitat, uh, even one nearby might be uh, either unsuited or even out of reach. 
They have very specific requirements then. Uh, for example, caterpillars might only feed on just one or two food plants. Um, sometimes not only must the climate be right, but the microclimate. So these are very specialized butterflies. They occupy a niche in the ecosystem. And uh, overall, you can see that the habitat specialists have declined the most since uh, 1976. Although we forget that wider countryside species have also suffered uh, considerable declines. So uh, we're often talking about fragmented, scattered populations. Uh, numbers can fluctuate. Sites and colonies can often be uh, small. And of course, the smaller the site and the smaller the colony, usually the greater the risk of uh, an extinction. And um, when we try to manage for, uh, for these very special fussy butterflies, um, then often it's better to look at a broader landscape rather than to try to, uh, to keep one isolated fragment going. If we can look at what's called a metapopulation, where there might be uh, several sites in an area that can support the butterfly, then it's often better to look at a broader, more landscape scale approach. Uh, just briefly, uh, what uh, we often try to do in butterfly conservation with, uh, with these particular species is to uh, assess the, uh, the status of the butterfly. Data collection is a key part of that. Diagnose what the problems are and, and test solutions and hopefully get the butterfly into some sort of recovery through the right sort of management. Now, ideally, if the management works, then we should aim to have a sustainable population rather than to constantly intervene and to try to sort of prop up things that perhaps really are unsustainable. So we're always looking for a sustainable solution. Okay, what a wonderful butterfly. A beautiful, it's a small butterfly. It's a pugnacious little butterfly. Matthew Oates describes it as a thug. It, uh, it, it, the males in particular are very territorial. Um, they will defend their territories. So they will try to chase off any interloper, any rival male, or indeed any other species that comes in. I've seen them having dogfights spiraling into the air with other species of butterfly, as well as with rival males. You'll see this one's resting on primrose. They, uh, they, they only lay their eggs on cowslip and primrose. And that's one reason again, why they're so particular. Um, they, they like uh, some limestones. Chalk is of course a, a limestone a very pure form of limestone. I like limestone grasslands, but really I think primarily it's actually a woodland species. And certainly in the past when there was more wood and while woods were still being coppiced, uh, even in the south of the UK, uh, they could be found in coppiced woodlands right across south and central England. And as you move north, uh, they were always much more fragmented and um, really not a common butterfly at all up uh, north of, say, Oxfordshire. So they're the two main food plants and uh, you'll see they are widely distributed. So you might think the butterfly should also be uh, widely distributed, but clearly there's a lot more to it than just having the, uh, the food plant present. Uh, as I mentioned, they, they have very special needs. There's the, uh, the outside of the butterfly. Uh, again, you can tell it's uh, May time. Perhaps those that know their flora will recognize um, bugle. Um, they do like bugle, bugles out in, the, in May. Um, and uh, it, uh, it very much reaches the peak of its, uh, of its um, uh, distribution in, in May. Right, so let's look and see where, where they're found today. Um, you'll see that the, uh, the main core areas are in the south and center of the Midlands and, and southern England. Uh, in particular around um, Dorset, Hampshire, um, Surrey, Sussex, um, Wiltshire, spreading into Gloucestershire um, and also into Oxfordshire and, and indeed Buckinghamshire and Bedfordshire uh, with an outpost in Kent, uh, a colony uh, up in Lincolnshire. And then just at the top of the map, you'll see a big gap. And then we come to Cumbria uh, and to South Cumbria and then Dave Wainwright's going to look at the, uh, the population over in the North Yorkshire Moors. So really those two northern colonies, the, the Cumbrian ones and the uh, North Yorkshire Moor ones are a long way away from the main core sites. 
Um, I mentioned that things have improved. So if you look at these graphs, you'll see that both occurrence and abundance declined drastically since 76. But if we look more recently, since 2005, uh, things have stabilized. Occurrence only gone up a little, but in those sites where it's still present, abundance numbers actually have picked up very well. So things are very promising, not quite so promising in the north, and in particular in Morecambe Bay, where you'll see um, there was a very big decline in the 90s. We lost a lot of sites. Matthew Oates did quite a lot of early work on this and uh, mapped out about 30 or 40 sites in, uh, in Morecambe Bay in the 1980s and 90s. But um, by the year 2000, you see nearly all of those have gone and numbers continue to decline, occurrence and frequency continue to uh, decline right down to reach a, a low figure around about 2013. But again, things have picked up a little bit since. But um, they will only be found, of course, where their food plant is. And more than that, they like lush plants. They don't like uh, ones that are too drought prone, too exposed to too much summer sun. So drying out is not good. They like sort of semi-shade. They like plenty of plants so the caterpillars can crawl from one plant to another. Um, they like um, a little bit of scrub um, and uh, a sward that's of varying height. It mustn't be too short. Um, these are all things that, uh, you know, they have their particular preference for. So, for example, males will like to perch at about half a meter or so above the ground surface and survey their territories. And that to a male duke is very important. So if it has a little bit of scrub and a bit of patchiness to it, that actually suits that type of male behavior. Um, we mentioned climate and microclimate, abundance of uh, the right plants, the overwintering conditions, these are all uh, crucial. So lots of healthy plants, flowering plants, plants that are close together. Um, primrose and cowslip do almost equally well. I think up in the Northwest, they have a slight preference for cowslip, but um, where you find cowslip and primrose together, you will find eggs on both. So it's certainly not one or the other. But there's um, a, a duke, um, perhaps sitting on a bramble leaf, surveying its territory. Uh, this could be um, late April when they start to emerge. Males usually emerge just a little bit before and they're already looking out for females, already looking out to be very territorial. Um, the females, on the other hand, as soon as they emerge, they're, they're mated almost straight away. There's no elaborate courtship. Um, and then the females behave differently. Uh, while the males are still posing and trying to dominate and dominate their territories, the females are looking for the right type of plant in the right condition, in the right place, at the right temperature. And they lay eggs. You'll see a batch of eggs here. We've got about six, seven, eight eggs. Usually it's one, two, three, four, five eggs, sometimes just a single egg. The abdomen is curled around under the, uh, the edge of the plant. So she sits on top of the leaf and lays the egg underneath uh, the leaf. Uh, there's a, another little batch of uh, glassy eggs. Now, they're not eggs for long, actually. They soon emerge. They can emerge as quickly as just a week, maybe two or three weeks later. But in fact, by the end of May, it's quite possible to see the last of the, uh, the adults on the wing still, sometimes even into early June. Um, you then can uh, find the eggs, uh, especially by just peeling back those leaves on those nice, healthy plants that are in semi-shade. Uh, Usually bigger leaves are, are a better bet. And where you get good plants, you can find quite a lot of eggs um, because they definitely have their, their preference for, for egg laying. And then you can find the caterpillars, as you can see here. Um, and in fact, at that time of year, you can find all three stages, um, the, the adult, the egg, and the, and the emerging caterpillars. And you notice that they do feed by creating these little windows, they, they eat out between the veins, often leaving a tracery of, uh, of veins behind. So it's quite a distinctive type of, uh, of pattern to the eating damage, the feeding damage. You can see it over here, for example. 
Um, if you find a lot of damage around the edge of a leaf, it's almost certainly a slug. So you, you can actually identify uh, if, if jute caterpillars are feeding. But really you have to, uh, to come out in the evening if you want to see them feeding, especially early on um, when they're quite young. It's best to come out with a torch if you're really keen and, uh, and have a look at uh, dusk uh, to, to try to catch them coming out and feed. Uh, there's a little bit more feeding damage showing these windows in, in the leaf and there's a caterpillar there. And sometimes they can do some serious damage, you know, where, where the plants are just right, they will really have a good feed up. And uh, the caterpillars certainly will, uh, once they get bigger, they're quite uh, greedy, they really get stuck in uh, uh, to their feeding. So, um, what have been the causes of the decline? Um, obviously scrub encroachment. I mentioned some scrub can be good, but uh, if it's not managed, then scrub encroach encroachment. That can lead to loss of food plants, of course, as well. Coppicing used to be very good. It is a really, certainly up here, uh, a butterfly that always benefited from, from coppice work. And uh, the lack of coppicing has certainly been a factor. Uh, sites have become small and fragmented, we mentioned, and there's a, perhaps a lack of uh, linkage, a lack of connectivity between the, uh, the different sites. Um, and some sites have become too, too grassy uh, and too much grass can swamp out, coarse grass, rank grasses can swamp out the primroses and cowslips. So a good thing obviously to try and collect seed and uh, it will, it will uh, grow well. We, we take seed to a, a, a local um, nurseryman who does a brilliant job in growing up cowslip plants in particular uh, for us. You can grow them in this way as well. Um, and of course, before you can plant the, uh, the seed or the, or the plugs, the plug plants, then do some coppicing uh, rather than um, sit back and say, well, that's all in the past. Let's get some coppicing going, get work parties out to, uh, to clear pockets of land, uh, to encourage primroses to grow and also to do some plug planting. Now here it doesn't look too patchy and I mentioned a little bit of scrub can be good, but um, the ideal areas are like this. And then after a year or two, some of the scrub starts to come back. You get a little bit of coarse growth. Uh, and after a year or two, then um, males and then the females find these pockets very useful. And then they reach their sort of pr most productive state, perhaps after another, another year or two. Uh, and then they can become too scrubbed and uh, basically uh, unsuitable for, um, for jukes. And so you then need to sort of clear another pocket and another pocket. And so it's a, it's a sort of coppicing type of approach that is best for these um, butterflies. Five minutes, Chris, please. Brilliant. We're gonna just shoot through some uh, slides on, there we are, that's what you really want, isn't it? Lots and lots of primroses or cowslips. And that will uh, give us, hopefully, um, a recovery uh, that will be sustained. You can see actually the Duke is down here. If I use the cursor, there's the Duke of Burgundy and we feel it's already on the recovery. So uh, we're getting towards sustainable management. Right, just quickly on the small blue then in the last five minutes, uh, there's the small blue top left and we've got kidney vetch, it's food plant top right. Stunning little butterfly, our smallest butterfly. Um, beautiful thing. Not to be confused, of course, with the, the common blue, which is much bigger. This is the male, which is blue. Of course, the female is brown. But with the small blue, that's as blue as they get. That's a male. You can see some blue scales, on the, especially on the hind wing and nearer to the body. Uh, and there's the, um, the female, which is less blue. Although in, in flight, they do look a little bit more blue than that. Um, on kidney vetch, that one... The caption says won't lay eggs because that's actually a male, but there it is uh, on kidney vetch and there are some mating male and female, a bit like a miniature holly blue on the, uh, the underside, but certainly a miniature. You can't really confuse the two and you can't confuse it with that. That's the common blue, blue again. And you see, if I just go back, look at the difference. There's the holly blue. There's, sorry, <laughs> beg your pardon. There's the small blue and uh, there's the common blue. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. And uh, kidney vetch can be easily outcompeted by 
ranker grasses. So you really need very, very poor substrate. And the, the railway cuttings and embankments in the northwest of Cumbria uh, were very good, you know, with all the ballast and the slag from the old steelworks and so on. Uh, the, all the old railway, industrial railway lines bringing in all that um, ballast and limestone. So they were great sites. So brownfield sites can be very good because uh, kidney vetch then can, can flourish under those conditions and doesn't get uh, overgrown and outcompeted by, by other species. Um, so what's happened, of course, though, is that uh, brownfield sites in northwest Cumbria are under threat from development, uh, from, from housing estates and, and obviously industrial estates, um, car parks, supermarkets, and so on. And so a lot of the work we've been doing up there in the northwest of Cumbria has been to try to mitigate against some of the worst impacts of, uh, of new development. And it's a battle, but if you, the blue areas here, um, this is at Workington, show where the uh, small blue is. And you can see how linear the distribution is. And that's because it's following railway lines and on old steelwork sites, which often did follow railway lines as well. So very geometric areas guided by the past industrial development of this site. This is just north of uh, Workington, and they are the old docks areas. One of the key core sites is this uh, old side wind farm, actually protected by, by, the, by the wind farm. And what we're trying to do then is to set up action groups, get the locals involved, do some uh, plug planting of kidney vetch um, and some seed scattering, creating scrapes. Uh, scrapes like this are great for getting rid of all that uh, soil that you don't want, get down to the substrate, the really poor calcareous rock underneath, um, and uh, then plant them up with kidney, with kidney vetch um, or with kidney vetch seed. And it will soon take hold. You can see it's coming along rapidly. There we are, lots of kidney vetch are flourishing. Uh, and it really, the, the small blue really responds very, very well to this. And before you know where you are, these scrapes uh, really are full of small blue. And indeed, uh, other species like dingy skipper and common blue and all sorts. And hillsides have been cleared of uh, the dreaded sea buckthorn. Uh, so that's what it was before, that's what it, was, what it is now. So the whole area really has benefited hugely from, uh, from this sort of uh, management. So anyway, um, I hope you've enjoyed that part. Um, I want to thank Steve Doyle, uh, Dave, Martin and Brian for use of their slides. And I'm just going to end with some pretty pictures just because I love lots of pretty pictures. So there we go. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. That was great. Um, love the pretty pictures always. Um, it's my turn now, so I'll just, if you could um, stop your screen share, Chris, and I will share mine. Thank you. Hi everyone, so um, as I said earlier, I'm Ellie Kent and I'm uh, leading on the Small Blue project for the, for the Back on Our Map project. Um, I'm gonna quickly just introduce you to what we've been up to, um, where we've been doing it and who we've been working with. Uh, so the main aim for the Small Blue project is to reinforce the population um, at the donor site, which in this case is Barrow Slag Banks. And we're hoping to do this through a lot of habitat management work. Um, and when we, happy that the population is sustainable and large enough, we'll look to do a translocation of adult butterflies to appropriate recipient sites in the project area. Um, just a quick introduction into the donor site. So uh, it's at Barrow Slag Banks, which is just here in this white circle. Um, it is just northwest of Barrow town opposite Warney Island. And it, you see it as you come down the A590 on your right hand side. Um, this enlarged, map here just shows that there's two, um, two slag banks there and we're focusing on the north bank where the butterflies are. Um, the history of these banks are, is really important because 
They were formed from over a century worth of um, waste from the iron and steel, steel works. Barrow actually had the largest um, steel, steel mill in the world in the, at the turn of the century. And um, it was supplying um, materials for the railways all over the globe. Um, as far as I know, the only, uh, apart from an archway that's being used for stagecoach buses now, um, the slag banks are just are the last reminder of the town's industrial past. So as well as the ecological importance, there's a big um, a cultural um, importance to these slag banks as well. Um, once the uh, steel mill closed in the 1980s, the council did, um, encourage a movement to decontaminate the, the area. Um, and they did start putting some soil and gardening a bit, um, mainly on the South Slag Bank, which is um, a bit lucky for us because in these pictures is the North Bank where the butterflies are. And you can see that there's a lot more um, bare limestone slag and lots of steep cliffs. Um, but this poor nutrient areas of bare, bare rock are actually really, like Chris said, perfect for kidney vetch. Um, and these areas of short and long sward with some ditches are great for male um, small blue butterflies roosting um, and finding territory. Um, when I first walked across this site with Chris, um, he told me that people tend to think of this, this bank as the ugly bank, um, which I found really sad because it's actually so beautiful, especially in spring. Um, when you go and you see all the limestone flora, there's heaps of birds and reptiles. And I even saw, I think was a stoat, but it could have been a weasel um, last autumn, um, which was lovely. So I do like to think, um, I, I know that there's a lot of respect for the, for the slag banks already, um, but I like to think that as part of this project, we can use the small blue to sort of change people's perceptions into it being a beautiful slag bank as well. Um, the, population of small blue that are here are actually translocated from Workington where they were um, living in a in a place that was um, ready to be built into a car park um, so that was in 2015 and since then there's been quite a stable population of small blue at the slag banks which is great news. Um, together with uh, Chris and Dave Wainwright um, we developed a little management plan and this is what we hope to do at the slag banks for the small blue. Um, mainly it involves creating scrapes and buns, similar to what Chris mentioned earlier. So the buns can be from a couple of meters to 20 meters long. They usually are crescent shaped and south facing. Um, they, they provide nice shelter for the butterfly as well as a little microclimate. Um, and then the scraped areas in the front are perfect for kidney vetch seed germination. So we're hoping to create these buns in this area here, um, scatter some kidney vetch seed in the scraped areas and also plant some kidney vetch plugs at the top of the buns um, so that when they do seed, they will seed down the slope to create like a rotation of flowering plants on those buns. Um, although the scrub um, is good in, in lots of ways to help keep this habitat mosaic, um, we are um, very aware that there's a lot of sea buckthorn and cotoneaster, all notorious spreaders. Um, so we are going to keep an eye on them and do some scrub management um, just so that they don't start um, invading the grassland and shading out the kidney vetch um, because it's very important that we keep the kidney vetch as free from um, any other sward as possible. Um, we're hoping to do a range of surveys at the slag banks but one, one I'm really, really keen to get, get done is um, hoping to train up a local volunteer. Well, uh, Dave Wainwright's offered to help train a local volunteer in mark and recapture surveys. I think this is incredibly important because it's going to give us the best estimate of population size of the small blue at the slag banks. Um, this will not only help us understand how successful, successful we've been with the habitat management, but also it will let us know how big the population is um, and if it's declining just because we don't want to do a translocation of a population that's declining or too small um, because we don't want to um, limit the population at the slag banks itself. 
So once we're happy that the population is sustainable and large enough, we will look to do a translocation to Hobbera Nature Reserve, um, which is just by Millam and is run by the RSPB. Um, it's an old quarry that was flooded to create this beautiful freshwater lagoon um, and is now a popular place for breeding terns. Um, I really recommend it as a lovely place to visit if you're ever in the area. Um, there is no small blue at Hob Barrow at the moment, but there is kidney vetch. Unfortunately, um, the kidney vetch is just in this really exposed area just here. Um, so we've been collecting some seed from that area and been scattering it in these shaded areas on the map here um, where we've been working and where it's good habitat. We've already created some scrapes and buns there um, and we've scattered seed there and we've also planted some plugs in the top of the buns there too. So it's all, it's all going on at um, Hogbarrow. Um, other sites we'd like to work in, um, Millam Ironworks is actually just a stone's throw away from Hogbarrow. Um, I know the small blue are meant to be very sedentary, but there is records of them traveling up to three kilometers. And Millam Ironworks is actually less than three kilometers away from Hogbarrow Nature Reserve and it's already got some fantastic habitat and kidney veg. So we're hoping that if things go well at Hobbarrow, that they may um, migrate and recolonize um, Miller Mine Works as well, which would be fantastic um, and help create that sort of meta population that Chris was talking about. Also sand scale haws, um, we we're not working with them yet, but we would, because they're doing a lot of dune restoration at the moment, um, but hopefully in the future we will. Um, and just quickly, who we've been working with um, as part of the Boom Project, obviously we, we have some fantastic volunteers and we're sort of built up on the foundations of the community. Um, we've already done a lot of planting with local volunteer groups and we're develop developing some great relationships with some local growers at Greenheart Den and Art Gene, who among, um, are growing many plants for us, but among them is kid kidney vetch, um, uh, and we're hoping that we they can grow some kidney vetch for us as a seed bank and then we can collect the kidney vetch from them and then scatter the seed in the sites. Um, also hoping to work more this year with residents from HMP Haverig who um, have offered to help us with the scrub management at the sites. Lastly, I just want, I like to think that the small blue offers us a little bit of hope um, they wouldn't exist on some of these sites if it weren't for the industry that had happened in the previous years. Um, and although there has been so much destruction of habitat, um, it's comforting to see some of these species benefiting from it in some way. Um, the most important thing now is to ensure that these sites are kept free from development. Um, although, although I credit the small blue for its resilience in reoccupying these lost landscapes, um, the population in Cumbria is now so fragile that um, it wouldn't survive another, another round of industry. But I, I do like to think that they give us some little bit of hope. Um, uh, thank you very much for listening. And I just wanted to end with this picture of a mature kidney vetch from a seed that I scattered in Hodbarrow last year. Um, and it's just nice to see some, some results. <laughs> um, thanks for listening. If you have any questions, just pop them in the chat. Um, and now I'll hand over to Mick to give you an update on the Duke of Burgundy. Thank you very much, Ellie. And I love the fact that you've described your small blue butterfly as a beacon of hope because boy, boy we all need a beacon of hope at the moment. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the Duke of Burgundy. Uh, project. Ellie and I are working this together essentially and uh, Chris Winnick and Dave Wainwright and Dave Wrigley and all sorts of other good people are involved as well. So what are we trying to do? Well the aim really is uh, to work with existing populations, reinforce or strengthen existing populations along Morecambe Bay and in the Ruslands Valley and expand the geographic range and metapopulation structure um, across the wider area. And I note that Ellie and Chris have both mentioned the word metapopulation. I might just, for the sake of some of you, might just be worth mentioning or, or defining what, what a metapopulation actually is. Um, it's, it's simply um, 
a group of geographically separated populations of the same species, which interact at same at some level, uh, usually dispersing and moving between these habitat patches through corridors of suitable habitat. So as far as the Duke of Burgundy is concerned, it just ensures if you've got Duke of Burgundy colonies at a larger number of sites, it just ensures that if there is a disaster, I don't know, a bushfire, for example, at one site, then you've still got these others to rely on and you're likely to avert a sort of local or regional extinction event. So it's just about not putting all your eggs in one basket, I guess. Um, I'm going to talk just briefly about these four points, but the methods that we that essentially we're using to achieve those aims are to conduct a whole number of surveys of adult butterflies, habitat, larval food plant damage and so on. Um, we will be restoring uh, habitat patches. We have embarked on a sort of captive breeding pilot, which I will talk to you about as well. And the idea or the aim is to scale that up if we can under very strictly controlled and supervised conditions. And then of course, the captive, the progeny of the captive breeding project will be translocated um, back into the landscape. So the first challenge that Ellie and I had um, that consumed a considerable amount of brain power uh, was just defining the areas we were going to work on because we only have so much capacity within BOOM between the two of us. And of course, COVID-19 has constrained efforts, has constrained our ability to go out and undertake a lot of survey activities and so on. So what we arrived at, and this is not, this is not um, set in stone by any means, was a decision that we would work across three particular, work within three particular areas and consider two translocations. So um, many of you will know that the strongholds, the remaining strongholds for Duke of Burgundy in, along Morecambe Bay are at Whitborough National Nature Reserve, um, just north of Morecambe Bay there. There is one very small population remaining in the AONB. Um, Duke populations used to be widespread across Yarnside and Silverdale AONB, but we're left with that one uh, small, small populations at Gates Bar Gate Barrows. And then Martin, uh, Martin Wayne in 2015, I, I think, found a, a really substantial and interesting population on the Malinia grasslands um, up there in the Ruslan Valley. So the plan really is to, um, the plan really is to captive breed and translocate from within the Rusland area from the west side of Windermere to the east side of Windermere. And then we're considering as a second translocation, a donor site on Whitbarrow and a recipient site in Gate Barrows. Uh, National Nature Reserve. So um, yeah, those are the priority areas we've come up with. You know, we trolled through the grey literature, the published literature, we acquired data from partners. We've done some habitat surveys ourselves and, and these are the priority areas that we singled out. The one thing that's worth mentioning at this point is that I'm not sure that anyone knows about the genetic differences or similarities between those populations on Whitbarrow that are generally in the woodland clearings and rides feeding on cowslip and the genetics of the populations feeding on primrose on those purple more gross more grass areas in Rusland. So at this stage it's probably because we don't have an understanding of how distinct those populations are or indeed whether there is gene flow between them um, we do not we do not intend to translocate between those two habitat complexes. So let's talk a little bit about um, surveys. Uh, we, follow, we will follow methodology from butterfly conservation slightly modified that Dave Wainwright has provided kindly to us um, to undertake habitat uh, surveys, um, both detailed habitat surveys that are 
quadrat based where we looked at where we look at structure and diversity and abundance of particular plant species and um, broader visual assessments across the wider compartments. Why are we doing that? Well, we're doing that to assess the condition of um, existing sites and potential, in other words, donor sites and potential recipient sites. Adults, well, again, we haven't had the opportunity to do this yet because of COVID, but again, within the flight season, when the weather is conducive, we will uh, undertake timed counts within these compartments of suitable habitat to try and get a handle on how, on, on, uh, how strong the populations are within existing sites. And again, um, after we've completed captive breeding, that's part of the monitoring process to ensure that the cat, the, those insects that were translocated are thriving. Finally, and I'm not going to talk about the diagram in the bottom left because those windows have been neatly described by Chris already. But the fact that you've got lots of adults in a landscape doesn't necessarily mean they're reproducing and you've got good stock for the following year. If the adults emerge in May and then you have a drought and all the larval food plants desiccate, then uh, the larvae and the pupae won't survive to give you uh, productivity the following year. So uh, habitat adults and larval food plants all need to be monitored, uh, surveyed very carefully. What about habitat improvement? Well, uh, Martin Wayne is the uh, human in the picture and he sits alongside these hardy native breeds of cattle. And that's just to demonstrate that actually there are two ways of restoring habitats. And I think they work really well synergistically. So, um, Certainly we have undertaken with, uh, on our own and, and with Butterfly Conservation, um, quite a number of work parties. That work is done in the autumn and winter and it's there to, con to control scrub, uh, bracken, bramble, um, hawthorn and that sort of thing. Um, it's a very effective tool at opening up the landscape to allow the larval food plants to thrive, as Chris has said. It's also, from a boom point of view, it's also a really useful tool for building those relationships we need to with the community. So it's a very useful way of enthusing and inspiring and teaching those volunteers that join us. But I would just caution, I would just say something slightly controversial, and that is that, of course, it's quite interventionist and it's a fairly intensive form of management that requires funding and uh, human power, manpower, woman power, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, thoughts about what happened before we had all of these keen volunteers to help out way back in the Neolithic, um, before the time that we'd settled and started farming and started clearing the landscape. And of course, in those days, uh, we had a suite of large herbivores that were engineering the landscape. And so I'm particularly interested in the conservation grazing side of things as well and it would be really great if Boone could put a student in place just to evaluate how you know different conservation grazing prescriptions impact on uh, the structure and diversity of plant species and the abundance of Duke of Burgundy. There's some really interesting work that um, the team at RSPB Geltsdale are doing at the moment with fenceless grazing, GPS collars that some of you will know about. Um, uh, I know that Jim and Glenn at um, Gate Barrows are also pulling down fences and to some extent letting the cows back into the coppice. So it's just another way uh, of, of improving the habitat. And of course the pandemic has taught us that while everyone's locked down, we can't actually go out and undertake those work parties. So it's, an, it's just another, um, another tool that we could use to restore habitats for Duke of Burgundy. We've, uh, there's Joe in the bottom left-hand corner at Haverig Prison. Haverig has some fantastic growers. They grow some splendid cowslips for us. We've grown several thousand cowslips now and planted out well over a thousand into the landscape. Myers allotment, gate barrows, whip barrow, I think as well and certainly have plans to continue that work. You know, we have been accused of gardening, but the bottom line is, and what we need to remember, of course, is that this species is monophagous. In other words, it just eats primulas. So you can have the perfect structure and the perfect connected landscape, but if you haven't got the larval food plants, you simply won't have Duke of Burgundy. Um, they're planted out 
in clumps. They tend, we tend to plant them out at the base of something structural like a male fern or bracken or a grass tussock because we know that the female dukes prefer those warm sheltered microclimates to lay their eggs. And of course, once the eggs emerge, if you've got a clump of, um, if you've got a clump of uh, plants, then the larvae can move from one to the other until they reach the pup, the, until they pupate. Okay, I just want to finish with one or two slides quickly. So captive breeding, why, why are we talking about, why are we thinking about captive breeding? Because we know from past experience that captive breeding is not straightforward and can have very mixed uh, results, certainly. Well, if it goes well, of course, the aim is to increase the survival rates in the early life stages of the butterfly and avoid those very high rates of natural uh, mortality. Um, uh, and we have a we have a pilot project ongoing at the moment. So just remembering, I think Martin Wayne and Ellie and myself and Julia Sear, the four of us, we went out into the Roslyn Valley in mid June, sort of between lockdowns, and we harvested just a very small number of probably first or second instar larvae. And I think bar one or two, we've successfully reared them in rearing cages and got them all through to. Um, the pupal stage and of course the oval they go right through the winter as a pupa and now we need to wait until we see a slight color change probably in late April when they're about to emerge as adults and then we'll place them back into the landscape. Now I just caution at the bottom that of course you know please don't try this at home that sounds a bit comedic but it's very serious all of this is done um under very, close, under very close scrutiny and supervision from colleagues at Butterfly Conservation and following their guidance and policy documents on translocation and captive rearing. So I think there are certainly as many things that could go wrong as, as could go right. You need to make sure that um, the population, the donor population you're harvesting from is robust. So certainly you need to survey beforehand. The other important point before I move on from this slide is just to say that, you know, creating new populations is relatively high risk. So to minimize that risk, probably half of the progeny from any captive breeding project would go back to reinforce the donor site from where those eggs were harvested. And we tend to harvest eggs rather than uh, uh, late stage or larvae. Um, for various reasons. So I won't go into any more detail, except to say that we hope if the conditions are right and the donor populations are abundant, we hope to scale that up over the next two or three years and, uh, and do the work that I've suggested. So just finally, I just want to remind, I, I, I just want to remind you that all of the Duke work is also rooted in the community. Um, we have a number of workshops and training events scheduled. Again, they haven't been able to go ahead, but certainly we want, we'd like to do some face-to-face -face, uh, workshops around habitat management, captive breeding, surveying. So they will go ahead when it's safe to do so. We have, we have uh, students who are interested in butterflies as well. So for example, um, placements and dissertations are available to us through the university. It would be fantastic to know more, for example, about the genetics of Dukes in Rusland compared to those populations at Whitbarrow. Um, we intend to do site visits and go up to see the good work that Dave has done in, in, in the York, in the North York Moors. So there are lots of engagement um, plans afield as well. We'll just have to wait and see how things pan out over the next few months. So I hope that gives you a flavor of the activities that are going on in partnership with BC for the Duke. Um, it's a great team effort and please join us and we can tell you how afterwards, but it'd be great if we could um, canvas some volunteers from this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mick. Um, and just a quick reminder that if anyone doesn't have any questions, just to pop them in the chat um, and we'll go through them at the end. Um, next up, we have Dave Wainwright to talk about North York Moors.
Dave, I think you're still muted. Right, can you hear me now? Yay, sorry about that. It's been a long day, as always. Um, yeah, um, I mean, basically I work for Butterfly Conservation. Um, I cover the north of England. And one of the species I've been involved with for the longest in the 17, 18 years I've worked for Butterfly Conservation is the Duke of Burgundy in the North York Moors. Um, it's a, a species I spent a lot of time with and I, it's got a, a big, big place in, in the work that I do. Uh, we've seen pictures of Duke of Burgundy already. There we go, there's the eggs. There's the feeding damage, there's some more feeding damage. This is what you get when you lend your slides out to people. But uh, moving on, we've got the distribution map there that Chris focused on. Now, if you can see my cursor, these are sites in the North York Moors, and we've essentially got two networks. We've got one to the northeast of Helmsley here, these two red dots to the west. And then we've got this other red dot, which is about probably 14 miles as the crow flies, which is just north of Pickering. We've got some sites there as well. So we've got essentially two different populations. They're, they're too far apart for the butterflies to travel. So they are kind of, to all intents and purposes, isolated from each other. <laughs> um, in terms of the, the Helmsley network, uh, the kind of red uh, oval, if you like, is probably about a kilometre long. And the, so that, that gives you some flavour of the the um, size and the, the scatter of sites around Helmsley. Uh, the, the red shape at the top is just encompassing some very, very small dots that don't really show up on a map of that scale, but to, to get all the sites on, I have to shrink the smallest ones to a point where they're nearly invisible, if that makes sense. Uh, Pickering sites are fewer, but it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's still present on some quite sizable sites. These are kind of looking at the sites. These are kind of mainly spring shots of various different sites. Um, a lot of the sites are limestone grassland, so the, the top left one and the top right is a woodland clear and there's a big um, concentration of limestone just under the surface. So they're, they're, the sites are pretty calcareous, pretty species rich in terms of flora, although they're Photographs don't really show that. Um, some sites have cow slips, some sites have primroses, and some sites have both. And the sites near Pickering, the, the uh, photograph on the bottom right, is actually a, a woodland colony. There are very, very few. Chris mentioned that it used to be a woodland butterfly, which is, is correct, but actually now there's probably 20 sites or fewer that are genuine the woodland sites in the UK sort of thing. It, it's made a, a bit of a switch into limestone grassland. Um, historically, it's been a butterfly that's not done terrifically well under the grazing management that's normally prescribed for limestone grasslands. There's a lot of the grazing that goes on to um, maintain the, the floristic diversity is actually too heavy for Duke of Burgundy. And it used to be the case for many, many years that it was actually a butterfly that was doing better on triple SIs that were in poor condition rather than ones that were deemed to be in suitable condition. I mean, the management probably serves 90% of the limestone grassland species, but when you get it rolled out across, uh, you know, sites throughout the UK, the, the small number of species that it doesn't address tend to drop through the net and those species really struggle and that, that's the, the kind of category that Duke of Burgundy was in for a lot of years. These sites are a little bit different and I'll, I'll explain why very very shortly. <laughs> so these are the photographs from the sites from Helmsley. Um, a lot of the, the woodland is um, semi-natural ancient woodland. There are, are stocked areas of broadleaf woodland and there's also areas of commercial conifer woodland, planted woodland, like those, those larch there. Um, the other economic drivers in that part of the world are, are sheep farming. There's a lot of, lot of sheep and some beef cattle. 
but a big economic driver is shooting, uh, particularly around the Duke of Burgundy sites, the pheasants and partridges. If you imagine the moors, the Duke of Burgundy colonies are on the, the southern side of the moors. Uh, they've got this limestone influence. Um, that's where the pheasant shootings concentrate, around the woodlands around there. Um, moving on to the heather mall and the more classical uh, vision that people have of moors, if you like, uh, that moves into grouse shooting. That's a, a different sport entirely sort of thing. Um, so a lot of the sites, because there's so much money tied into shooting in that part of the world, um, there's not the same uh, impetus to get sites into conservation management. The payments for, for managing sites for wildlife are really, really minuscule compared to what these big estates can derive from charging clients, you know, maybe perhaps seven, eight thousand pounds a day to go and shoot there. You know, there's amounts of money, a serious, serious business sort of thing. And, you know, the grazing at best would have been marginal even back in the day when the sites were grazed. And the, the kind of uh, marginal grazing, if you like, has, has just dropped out entirely sort of thing with the result that a lot of, of this limestone former grassland is turning into scrub and is, uh, in some cases turned into mature woodland sort of thing. It's, it's you know, develop, it developed all the time. <laughs> um, the Duke of Burgundy in Yorkshire went through a real, real bad spell. Um, there were, 17 colonies in the mid 1990s and I'll, I'll go back to that a bit later but that number had dropped to eight by 2008 you know the the, the number of sites was was dwindling most of the populations were small as uh, so i know someone put on the chat a question about the um worries about inbreeding um a lot of the colonies single day counts were fewer than 10 adults you know things had really got really really bad they may or may not be inbred but generally i think when butterfly populations drop to such low numbers um that inbreeding becomes a problem they're on the way out anyway sort of thing there, there are other factors that will see them off first before they get too inbred to be able to to carry on um the sites were becoming increasingly isolated and as mick alluded to in his, his mention of metapopulations. Um, the sites, as they kind of drop out of the network, if you like, the ones that are left are further and further apart. The ones that have gone extinct are increasingly unlikely to be recolonized. And as I've mentioned, there were serious management issues of the ground floor of the shrub layer and the canopy sort of thing. All these things were, were wrong in lots of cases. Um, this is the Pickering network. Um, the last pocket of Duke of Burgundy habitat was actually on the fringes of the railway line there. That's the driver, you can see the driver there, he was busy shouting abuse at me for trespassing on his railway line <laughs> trying to look for Duke of Burgundy's, but literally in the Pickering area the butterfly got uh, whittled down to that, literally you can see the primroses on the track side and that, that is where the butterfly was restricted to. So um, We'd had a lot of volunteer involvement. We'll go back to the volunteers very, very shortly because they've had a massive, massive impact in what we've been doing. Um, but butterfly conservation, my, particularly my predecessor in this job, Sam Ellis, put together a, a bid to REN, who are a landfill tax redistribution company who distribute money for environmental causes. And basically we got a, a grant for about a quarter of a million quid with about half of it to be spent on uh, habitat management. Uh, we got more funding from the National Park and uh, Butterfly Conservation Yorkshire branch contributed, uh, as did uh, Natural England a bit. And the aim was to manage 34 sites for, for Duke of Burgundy and Pearl Border Fritillary Butterfly, which I won't mention, which doesn't occupy many sites at all. It's even scarcer than the Duke. And the sites we were looking at doing were ones with the Duke still on, so we were doing a, a, you know, an enhanced maintenance regime, if you like, above and beyond what volunteers could do. Uh, we were looking at extinct sites from which the butterfly had been lost, which presumably are in a sort of a semi-marginal condition and could be reverted. And also looking at improving potential sites where the butterfly had never been recorded, but where the habitat looked really, really good. And we were looking at scrub, woodland and grassland different habitats, you know, addressing both the woodlands and the grasslands for the butterfly. 
And that gives you some idea of the, the kind of scrub levels. I mean, these are kind of two old thorns, if they're 40 years old, some of those, they're big, big bushes and they're 15 foot tall, sort of thing, massive things. And lots and lots of the sites were looking like this. So we spent a lot of money getting contractors out, um, basically starting to cut this stuff down. We had a, a very, very tight working window. The pheasant shooting season operates from the uh, start of November to the start of February, which constricts the work period very, very tightly before the end, end after the end of the shooting season, because they wouldn't let us on to do this when they were busy shooting pheasants and um, the start of the wild bird nesting season sort of thing. So the, the work had to be really, really um, primed to go and the contractors had to work really, really hard and really, really fast. A lot of these guys were working seven days a week to get the, get the work done. Fantastic efforts. And slowly but surely, they were able to kind of work their way through some really, really big tracts of scrub and woodland uh, and to clear some really extensive areas. I mean, that, this kind of gives you a flavour of the scale of the work that's been done. You see the four burn sites in there, those fire sites, each of those are probably five metres by five metres. So you get the, the kind of scale and the scope of some of these sites. We also got, um, because none of the sites are great, there's no, um, I mean, a lot of the sites are small, and you wouldn't get much of an area of payment in terms of stewardship money for managing these. But in terms of the estates, the, the income is tiny sort of thing, even if you could get people willing to graze such tiny areas. So we got people in with things like this tractor mounted, quad mounted flail to break up the tussocks of dense grass, which you can see at the right hand side of the picture, which is too, too dense, too thick for the primulas to be able to seed themselves. But you flail, flail it with a chain, you get some seeding of the plants that allows the plants to regenerate naturally. Um, one for the health and safety contrast, some of these steep sides we were uh, operating blind on, but this is a pearl bottom fertility site actually, but uh, again you can see the, you know, the fertilities like the bracken and the violets, but the gorse is a, a killer sort of thing, so we have to get rid of the gorse. Uh, that's a woodland site, that's Pickering Woods, where we've done a, a big ride widening exercise sort of thing, but I'll, you know, it, it's comparable to some of the work in Whitbarrow almost. It's almost on that sort of scale that's been done there. Uh, again, uh, planting out of primulas played a part sort of thing, but I mean, the, I stress that the, the management of the sites is key. You can plant lots and lots of primulas, but in terms of the butterfly, you need to be managing, the, the habitat needs to be sustainably growing these things itself sort of thing. It needs to be able to regenerate. <laughs> so has it been, has it worked? Um, well, these are the results. Up till 2008 was when we started doing this. This is just a really, really simple graph. This is just the totals of the maximum counts added up together sort of thing. We do a bit more complex analysis using transect and time counts, but to the non-technically minded like myself, this is a, a really good snapshot of how effective this has been. Um, 2020, obviously, the recording was hit by COVID. We missed the flight period on the south facing sites uh, to a large extent. So I, I don't think it was a magnificent year for those sites because the south facing sites like that didn't have snow on them in April and May in the flight period. If you remember, when we were all locked down in April, the sun was absolutely cracking the flags. And these sites are steep. They, really, they don't look it on the photographs, none of the photographs do them justice, but the soil's very, very thin. For example, you couldn't really plant cowslips very easily on there because the soil's that shallow. South facing, really free draining limestone, you, the sun gets on that and it just kills everything off. It's really bad for the cowslips as well, it, it droughts the cowslips, but in a strange way, it's really, really good. We don't need to graze these sites. You know, for years and years and years, I was reading about how Duke of Burgundy sites all should be grazed to maintain the swarm. And that I think that's probably true, but these steep ones um, dry out periodically. You get a, a run where, where the cowslips seem to be going, but then you get a real drought. It kills all the uh, rank vegetation, and then you get a couple of good years where it's wet where the cowslip crop really regenerates they really come back well and of course in that part of the way you see a bit of snow on there when this was taken sort of thing we still get proper winters in that part of the world I'm sure the absolute bone chilling frosts that we get help knock some of the vegetation back that compete with the primulas as well and they're, they're actually 
if you can keep them free of scrub, I think a lot of these are, are fairly self-sustaining. So anyway, this is a, a map showing the Duke network in Helms in 2010. This is 2019. There were no new colonizations in 2020, so this is effectively up to date. But just flicking between them, you can see that the butterflies actually, you know, sort of not only increasing in numbers, as we saw on the graph, it's actually spreading out and recolonizing some of these sites that were managed and has expanded into bigger areas on the ones where it was present, where we've taken scrub and stuff on from. Uh, adjacent areas to the grassland. Pickering was a different kettle of fish. We couldn't really get permission to do a right lot on their land until 2010. So they kind of came into the scheme a bit before a lot of the other estates that we'd worked with for longer. But this is the where we showed the train with that little patch of habitat. Butterflies starting to respond now. We've done a tremendous amount of work there, coppicing work and, and ride widening. And now the butterfly is starting to pick up. So if we go to the map, that, that's that little patch where the train was. And now we can see that by 2019, 10 years later, it's gone on to the cycle and Bank, where we've done a lot of work on the right. And it, it's gone up into a place called Yats Farm on the, the top left sort of thing. Um, and it's spread out immensely within the woodland. That, that long ride uh, through the woodland near the railway line is where I showed the, the picture with the log stacked up and long, the long line cut through sort of thing. So butterflies doing okay, it's spreading out, it's good. Um, so the update of the Yorkshire uh, status, we had uh, reduced to eight by 2008, reduced to eight colonies by 2008. We're now back up to roughly the same number of colonies that were present in the mid 1990s. Um, in 2008, the populations were mainly small with a lot of single day maximum counts of fewer than 10. Uh, in 2019, four colonies yielded counts of over 40 adults and one managed 103. We haven't updated this, but we actually got one this year that actually surpassed a different site that actually nailed 104, which is comparable to anywhere in the UK. <coughs> it's worth remembering that you know, we don't have quite the species diversity that there is in the Morecambe Bay area for butterflies uh, in the North York Moors, but we've still got some real good ones. We've got dark green fertilities, green hair streak. We frequently count over a hundred of these on some of the some of the Duke sites in a single day count. We've got dingy skippers, maybe 60, 70 on some of the bigger sites is a is a reasonable count. We get brown argus as well, which is always I've been there for as long as I've been going, but it's spread a lot further north now, but the, the populations are still there breeding on the rock rows. And you, you kind of, when you're doing the, the butterfly counts and stuff, we always get lots of day flying moths. The assemblage is really pretty one sort of thing. We get Sisters Forester, which isn't exactly the same as the one behind my, my head on the, on the background sort of thing, but it's very, very closely related. That lays its eggs on rock rows. Uh, we get things like Burnet Companion, um, not common moth in Yorkshire at all, although you do get it on the Barrow Slag Bank telly sort of thing, that'd be one to look out for when you're out and about. Um, we've got small yellow underwings, lovely little moth. Um, I've seen more on the Duke sites than I've seen anywhere else. And things like uh, Aurora uh, purpuralis, Pyrousta purpuralis, sorry. Um, so what we learned from this, I mean, the monitoring is really, really important. I'm going to mention that a little bit more very shortly. Um, as we stood in 2008, before we got that big grant, the, the maintaining the existing sites wasn't enough. We were still losing sites. Numbers were, were de in decline sort of thing. It needed a boost. Um, I know Martin will probably um, tell you lots about the uh, landowner work he's done sort of thing in a way. It's a different setup down there. We're dealing with fewer landowners, but if you get the wrong side of them, it takes a big, big number of sites out of the equation that you get permission to manage. As it stands, we've had input now into all the Duke of Burgundy sites in the North York Moors. Uh, I suspect Martin's dealt with many, many more landowners than I have, but these ones have been particularly tricky and particularly powerful. We've had to really walk a tightrope sometimes um, in terms of agreeing and disagreeing over conservation interests, shall we say. But the, the 
been largely behind the touchwood. Um, large scale habitat enhancement isn't cheap, but it is proven to work. And I mean, when, you know, it's, this is taking up part of my staff time and a big grant to kind of help put us where we are today sort of thing. I, I haven't mentioned volunteers yet, but volunteers have done an immense amount and I am gonna mention them. But, um, you know, when you look at the money that's been thrown about under the current pandemic to furlough people and to, to maintain jobs sort of thing, really, if you're looking at, you know, figures, the amount needed to conserve some of these rare species is really, really tiny in terms of what the government's capable of pulling out of his back pocket at loose terms. We need to be getting onto them for this. Um, but if you get the management right and get the habitat in good condition and get the, the connectivity back, the Duke will do a hell of a lot of the work for itself sort of thing. It, it didn't respond immediately to this. There were two or three years where we thought none of it was going to work. We were cutting down scrub and trees left, right and centre. And the Duke numbers were, yeah, we're getting some good counts, but equally we were getting some disappointing ones. And not much evidence of recolonisation, but really since then it's rolled and it's rolled and it's rolled. It's gone great. A couple of minutes, Dave, please. Sorry, sorry, Mick. A couple of minutes, Dave, please. A couple of minutes, sorry, OK. Yeah. Uh, regional trends, we break down, we do a lot of analysis using time count and transit data sort of thing. These aren't the um, totals, single day count sort of thing, but you can see the Duke's doing differently in different parts of the world sort of thing. The South West is not doing great. North West is a bit misleading because we don't have any... Uh, concerted monitoring on the, the Rustland sites. We could really do with people doing time counts and transects that are feeding into the data set. North York Moors, we get some good data and it's picking up there sort of thing. So, you know, I think what we're doing is working. I would otherwise work, that's for you guys to find out. We've not been successful in introducing the species, but on the other hand, we haven't needed to. We tried it, but it hasn't worked. So I'll leave that to, to the Boom Project to master. Um, the volunteers, lastly, this is a big thank you because they, they, so many people have put so much work into this in all kinds of weather. We've got people out in the sun doing, you know, sort of bracken bashing and things like that. And we've got people working in the snow and the frost, um, in freezing fog and things like that. And just before I finish, I would like to say that I've had some really, really massive help from volunteers. A guy called Robert Parks who's been involved with this project from long before me, 1993. Steve Curtley, another gentleman who did a lot of the survey work when, you know, it was virtually sneaking onto sites, the dodging the gamekeepers to get on and find out where the Duke of Burgundy's were. Robert in particular has maintained an interest, but Steve as well, those, those two guys have been absolutely fantastic with this and I couldn't have done a fraction of it without their input and their assistance setting it up. So um, that's about my lot really. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, we have run a little bit over time, but I um, hope you hope you will all stay for the next next talk. Last but not least, we've got Martin. Um, you ready, Martin? Bloody on mute. Can you hear me now? Yep. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, just a quick 10 minute tour around our engagement with farmers and landowners promoting Duke of Burgundy conservation. So I work for Butterfly Conservation. I've only been here for uh, about 12 years, not as long as Dave. Uh, I've been based in Morecambe Bay. We work on projects. Uh, we haven't had vast amounts of money to spend on the Duke of Burgundy necessarily. It sort of fits in alongside lots of other things that we do. So at the moment, I've got three hats. I work with, um, yep, come on. There we go. I work on the Morecambe Bay Facilitation Fund and that's about, da, da, da. that's working with uh, facilitation members and bringing benefits to the economy, biodiversity, community, finding win-win solutions, uh, necessarily working with farmers and landowners. 
I have um, I work with the Walney Project Extension uh, Community Fund as well, and that's working with communities and landowners to manage woodlands for wildlife benefits. We do work on Whit Barrow and in the AOMB with that scheme. And also we've just got some money on the Green Recovery Challenge. That's finding nature-based solutions in response to COVID and the climate crisis and also the biodiversity crisis. There'll be a lot of woodland management in that too. And that the Duke of Burgundy benefits from that because we've got some funding to work on Challon Hall, which is next to Gate Barrows, which has some good cowslips and primroses in. We've got some money to work on Whitbarrow as well. So we could help extend and move the Duke of Burgundy around that site. So this is the facilitation area. It's a little bit vague, but it just it sort of gives you an idea. All these coloured patches are landowners that we work with. Uh, we've got 84 members at the moment. Um, it started in uh, 2015. Uh, we've just got an extension year uh, to carry on doing all the work that we do. Uh, besides the Duke of Burgundy, we also work on other priority species with landowners like the small pearl bordered and the high brown fertility. They become a bit of a focus for us and they help us to uh, get farmer interest or landowner interest because they're helping uh, priority species and it's that nice warm feeling of helping butterflies and moths that we tend to uh, we like to uh, 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 we like to do. So the Duke of Burgundy, uh, every, we've had an introduction already, feeds on primroses. Uh, we work very closely with a whole range of brilliant local naturalists. Here's Tony and Heather Marshall taking photographs of the Duke of Burgundy eggs. These are the beautiful pearly white things. Quite easy to see on the um, on the bottom of the uh, leaves. So it's a good a good way of monitoring numbers. And also, uh, as we've been through this, feeding damage uh, by the caterpillars as well is a good way of monitoring uh, how the butterfly is doing. So working with uh, landowners. So uh, Chris has already talked about the, um, the butterfly being on limestone areas. And uh, we have this area that Mick was describing, this acid uh, grassland sort of uh, habitat, which until, until uh, 2011, we didn't really know that the butterfly was on this. So the primroses exist in here in a sort of Goldilocks sort of area um, on a slope, usually on a slope, not where it's not too dry and not too wet, where it's not being too heavily grazed. And we find this is a, tip, a typical sort of patch where we've got the primroses growing on the edge of the bracken. So the bracken is too dry because the bracken dominates the dry sort of patches where uh, uh, the leaf litter falls down and the primroses can't survive. And on the left hand side of that is the millennia, which is in the wet patches and the primroses sort of live in this sort of area in between. And this is where the Duke of Burgundy is uh, breeding. So um, how we work with landowners. So there's the Duke of Burgundy and there are the sites on the limestone areas of Whitbarrow. Those are uh, colonies. The white blobs are the colonies that we found in 2011. Uh, I went out with Rob Petley Jones, who I believe is in on this meeting as well, so I think he should take some credit for this, uh, and Laura Civil, and we found one uh, site where the Duke of Burgundy was, was breeding, uh, and as we looked and looked a little bit further and jumped over a few fences, we began to find this sort of uh, collection of a metapopulation of the butterfly uh, um, living in this sort of area of um, acid grassland uh, where the grazing had been very limited in the past years, the primroses were flourishing and the primroses we were finding in banks like this. So there can be big banks, there can be small banks and the butterfly sort of moves between the two, the two banks and, and often breeds on all of these sites in the same year. Sometimes it deserts one of them uh, but often goes back to them maybe the next year. So working with the landowner here, this is a, um, a public, um, 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 this was the Lake District National Park we mentioned it to the Lake District National Park that they had Duke of Burgundy on their site. They were chuffed to bits, uh, they wrote it into their management plan and we worked with them through the nature improvement area money that we had at the time to uh, cut down some of the large trees and open up some sunny rides and glades. And they were very happy to, to work with us because we had a bit of money and we could do some of the woodland management for this species. Uh, talking to the landowner above there, this is a private landowner. We, we were negotiating with him, he was going into countryside stewardship. So we, we, uh, we worked with him on some woodland management work and also helped him to get into countryside stewardship. And he was chuffed to bits. That brought him a regular income on this site for five years. He also allowed us to put in uh, planting of cowslips, uh, sorry, planting of primroses. And I think we, with the uh, volunteers for the Cumbria branch, we planted about 2000 uh, primroses here, creating stepping stone habitat between these, um, these um, uh, primrose sites. 
Looking further and further around in the next three or four years, we found other patches of primroses. They're the yellow, uh, they're the yellow dots. And in 2015, uh, some more um, 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 Duke of Burgundy uh, um, populations we found in another site. So we're beginning to sort of look out for the butterfly and the primroses to try and create these stepping stone uh, areas across the landscape. The pink area was an area of uh, forestry uh, 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 clearance that the landowner had allowed us to look at, uh, sort of an extension really. Uh, and getting on with these landowners, as Dave said, is really important. It allows us to have access to these sites and to build up a, a big landscape picture about where things are. So we found other uh, patches of primroses about, and this landowner we, have, we approached and he was, he'd come out of countryside stewardship, wasn't able to get in. We got him into higher tier based on the work of the Duke of Burgundy and he was absolutely delighted with that. It brought him five more years of funding and we also managed to, through countryside stewardship, get some monitoring done on here. So not only are, is he um, um, farming his farm, but he's also looking out for the Duke of Burgundy. And he sends me photographs of the primroses and how they're doing and all the uh, butterflies that he's seeing. Um, we work with this landowner to get them into uh, countryside stewardship. We, we help them a bit with some of the boundary uh, uh, expenditure through the NIA in about 2014 or so. And uh, we've, we've been working with them to um, clear patches of scrub over uh, the uh, areas of primroses that they've got. Uh, this landowner was already in a lower tier of uh, countryside stewardship, well these two landowners, they're about to go into higher tier of countryside stewardship next year based again on work around the Duke of Burnby. So we're sort of using all sorts of um, gears and levers here to get landowners involved. They're genuinely interested in working with us, they find countryside stewardship is a useful tool and so do we because it gives us a, an element of uh, capital spend so we can plant uh, a couple of thousand primroses at some of these sites and it also enables us to do some monitoring through through the countryside stewardship. Natural England then got in touch with us about this site uh, around based around Gummers How they uh, the uh, the person there had found some primroses we went and we found loads of primroses no Duke of Burgundy but lots and lots of primroses so we started looking further afield and we found primroses in this woodland uh, area site next door. So an extended site, it's a, it's a, a forestry plantation, they're beginning to listen to us about leaving uh, sunny rides and glades where the primroses are uh, and we are beginning to sort of spread the, the potential of this butterfly to move across the habitat on the east side of Windermere. Natural England got us in touch with the National Trust who own that site, again we got them into countryside stewardship, planted 2,000 primroses at that site and then we started to work with other landowners who were interested. So the two pink ones at the bottom came through our facilitation fund. They've become members of the facilitation fund. They're interested in looking out for primroses. And the grey area is the Forest Commission at Chapel Howe. And they're really interested in working with us, uh, helping us to, to find uh, uh, cowslips or primroses in there. And also that brought in uh, Grisdale as well, where we know that uh, more recently there's been a sighting of, uh, of the Duke of Burgundy. Um, so last year and the year before that, we, we found these two areas. Then Boom came on to the, um, in the equation and we're absolutely delighted to work with Boom at this stage because it's such an interesting sort of stage for this butterfly. We have on the east side of Windermere all these opportunities for the butterfly to move into. Uh, we, we have not completed all the survey work uh, and it's lovely to work with Ali and Mick on this and maybe contact some landowners and get them involved in countryside stewardship and begin to build up this picture uh, across the, the landscape again. Um, has it worked? Well, last year I am quite convinced that I found feeding damage on this site uh, in Rusland and also at this site as well. So with those two lovely springs that we've had, it looks like the female butterfly has been spreading out and we might be getting feeding damage on those. Not only that, there's another area here, which is a stepping stone from here to um, that one. And I think that we found feeding damage there as well. But all this sort of takes monitoring. And Mick and Ellie, that's where your volunteers come in and your students could come in and then we could work out uh, how, how strong and how successful this uh, um, butterfly has been moving across the landscape. That might be it. There's just a picture of my uh, facilitation fund as it stands at the moment, with all these landowners waiting to work with us. Great, thank you, Martin. Definitely looking forward to getting into all that monitoring. Excellent. Um, we have run over time, um, but if people want to stay for one or two questions, um, 
we can do that really quickly and then we can answer any other questions in emails um, if that's all right with everybody. Um, there's just, I think you touched on this in your in your presentation, Dave, but there was a question from, from John. Um, do butterfly species in small populations suffer through lack of genetic variation? Don't forget to unmute yourself, Dave. <laughs> Sorry about that, I do that every time. Uh, I don't have any evidence that they do. I think honestly that if a butterfly population has diminished to the point where inbreeding is likely to become a problem, the factors that drove it to that low level in the first place are, are are the ones that will drive it extinct far, far more quickly, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? It's uh, it's in a bad state before inbreeding becomes a problem. Um, theoretically, yes, you know, the, the effects of inbreeding are known sort of thing, but whether or not it's small populations persist for long enough for that to become a factor, I'm not sure. Michelle, could we ask you a question? There was a question here from uh, someone, Gemma, Gemma Wren. Are you doing any youth engagement as part of the community work in Boom? Do you mind answering that? Yeah. Yes, of course, that's fine. Yes, I've, well, I've, I've said Gemma and I are going to have a little chat separately. <laughs> um, but yes, we are. It's a big part of, of the programme is to get new people and uh, connecting to nature and, and having a go at things and, and learning new skills. So um, there are projects across the species in Boom to work with organisations like Drop Zone in Barrow, which is a youth youth support um, project, and uh, also with Beaumont College and uh, hopefully to get them doing the John Muir Award and working on some of the boom projects. And there's also a whole raft of uh, kind of creative arts and nature projects to find ways for people to get engaged with the species in, in new ways. Um, perhaps people who never normally get involved with outdoor volunteering or anything like that, but might like to try something different. There's also some technology, digitization projects and things in the mix as well. Uh, a lot of that hasn't been able to start yet because of COVID um, and everything just being all up in the air last year. But we hope to move it forward this year and, and find alternative ways of doing things if we can't do things as planned. Um, so, yeah, there is a lot of schools work, as Gemma said, too, but um, definitely work with, with youth groups and volunteers of all ages and uh, people involved with uh, organisations like The Well in Barrow. They're volunteering through Greenheart Den, uh, people recovering from drug and alcohol addiction and those sorts of organisations we're working closely with as well and hope to build up um, a, a network of, of people involved with Boom um, in the coming years. So does that give a bit of a, a taster? Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, there's someone asking if you're still looking for volunteers, Dave. At the Pickering sites. Yeah, definitely. Great. Um, <laughs> I'll put my email address in the um, chat box and then they can drop me an email if they want. Good idea. Um, I think most of the other questions have been answered in the chat. Um, we have recorded this as well, so if people want to re-watch it and have any questions, <laughs> then feel free to email us. Um, if anyone has any other questions, just pop them in. I think, I think we're good. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and I'd love to say a big thank you to, to all the speakers, um, and of course, a big thank you to Michelle for helping us out. Um, thank you for coming. <laughs>